So I think my my vision was to kind of get in and explore the Saturn cycles a little. And I would love to hear your experience with them, you know, personally, and I'll share mine as well. And I really wanted to go more past the second Saturn return as well. Since yeah. that's yeah, a I've become an expert on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of neat, right? One of the best ways to survive your transits is to not die. <laughs> <laughs> right. Breathe in, breathe out, repeat. That that's always been my policy. <laughs> so far, so far. You know, when I was a young astrologer, uh, I was in this awkward position. I, you know, I've had clients of all ages. And so folks older than me would come in for readings, having their second Saturn returns. And uh as uh I, I, I was only trusting theory, basically, since mm -hmm. I, I had no direct experience of it. When I, I finally began to approach my own second Saturn return, I, I was a little nervous. It's like, you know, I, I hope everything I've been saying to people all these years <laughs> has some bearing up on my own experience. And and it turned out it, it did, you know. It, so I, I, I learned more about it, of course, by going through it. But the, the symbols themselves didn't lie. I, I can I can launch into a theory of the second Saturn return, but then I'll be on the podium doing a lecture and you may go to sleep. And you know, so <laughs> I highly, that. highly doubt it. I'm a, I feel like Saturn and I have become kind of we're bedfellows for sure. There's a uh -huh. lot, a lot of learning for me that has been direct just going to the Saturn. So, but I'm also starting to attract in more people at the second Saturn return. And uh -huh. so I have been in that place exactly that you're talking about where I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I know that I'm going to just have to purely rely on technique, yeah. you know, just, just the symbols and walk through it and enough compassion with another human being. Yeah. And then we see that'll work. That'll work. And it's one of the vanities of uh, of old age, of course, not not that you're quite there yet. But one of the vanities is that uh, we don't want to take advice from young people. You know, I, I mean, Jesus could be 11 years old and giving us excellent advice, but we don't want to hear it. He's just a kid. You know, it's it's just the Maya of of the of the body, the illusions it, it creates. But uh, it is a reality. And and so. Uh, it's a disadvantage to be a young astrologer in, in that you uh, much of uh, the part of the population that has enough money to afford a reading is not interested in having a reading from you because you're right. still a kid. You get into midlife and, and uh, yeah. whether you deserve it or not, there's a certain authority that begins to accrue to you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I have definitely... <laughs> had that experience. I just turned 41 and it was like somewhere in there is when my client base really changed. And it was one, they thought that they could trust the astrology that I was doing. And that was a lovely thing. Um, but also some demonstration of a dance with, with Saturn seemed to be apparent. And that was about it. And I'm, so you know what I've decided is that no matter what, I'm a pretty good cheerleader. I've got enough Venus in my chart that I am a good cheerleader. <laughs> I'm like, so I'll give you the symbols and then I'll just support you through it. How about that? If that's yeah. what Beautiful. you need. Beautiful. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a good We've place. got the, the, the roadmap for people. I mean, within limits, we, we can't be totally directive, but we can, we can certainly be helpful, supportive. Uh, uh, symbols make us wiser than we mm -hmm. might be without them. And, uh, and and we can share that. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, the whole process has been beautiful. So should we should we actually get in here and and have a little chat? And we won't go too terribly long, but yeah. I think some some good experience is good experience. Yeah, let's let's dive in. Ask me anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll share this with you really quickly before we before we start. But I was thinking about you yesterday because I am at I'm just at the the place. You know, I'm in the Neptune, Neptune, but also my dance with Saturn is I realize time is just time. Like it just, it's kind of like, it just is what it is. And it made me think about this talk and a young man, he's 25 and he has decided I am the love of his life. And I'm like, oh, I assure you, I'm not, I am also very married, but whatever you're seeing is not what you're seeing. But it was, it wasn't that Stephen, it was an awareness that I was like, 
oh, this is, there's a lot of time in between us. Do you know what? I don't know if that makes any version of sense, but I was, I think for the first time in my life, aware of time in that way. Uh huh. And time, I was like, our, our, our rela- time is what it is, uh, as you say, of course, but a, a strange thing happens that our relationship with time changes uh, as we mature. The, the, the kind of simple thing to say is every year goes by faster than the year before. And everybody says that. And it's it's easy to understand it when you're two years old. That's you know half your life. When you're 50, it's 2% of your life. So the logic is there. And then we can see it humanly, like tell a teenager they have to wait for an hour. <laughs> And you're going to get some attitude, you know, if, if your flight is delayed and you have to wait for an hour, you know, you shrug your shoulders. It's just an hour. So the, the this is all fairly obvious, but the next steps are less obvious and, and very much connected with the spirit of Saturn, I think, and the process of maturation that it, it, it triggers in us. It, it's that uh, the, the, the sense of we count time arithmetically every year you're you're older but we pass through it logarithmically faster and faster and faster which leads me to something so obvious to say but so heavy that i've never heard anybody else say it in my life it'll sound terrible so bear with me by the time you get to your second saturn return what you're starting to realize is I'm going to die very, very soon now, which, you know, of course, immediately all our cultural training. And so, oh, my God, don't say that to somebody. They're only 60. You know, they they probably have a few miles left in them. You can live to be 100. And those 40 years are going to go by like a rocket, you know, because we pass through time faster and faster. And, And so... Uh, Of course, all the cultural bugaboos come up. It's like, don't don't say that, Steve. That's so negative. Death is the most negative thing we can imagine, which is such a terrible illusion right there. But see, the effect of this is is that as every cell in your body realizes, I don't have much time left, the time becomes really precious and we re-enter the realm of cliche, you start to think about what's really important in life and what isn't so important in life. And and uh, my my next step here, I'm launching into lecture mode, but I'm having fun. Hope you no, are it's too. It's great. It's fantastic. The, the, the next step is I, I, given all the negativity about aging in the culture, here's medicine that reverses it based on what I've just said. That We think of everything that has made you crazy in your life so far, you know, in the generic broad sense of crazy. Let me guess, human sexuality (laughs) is on the list, you know, let me guess, money is on the list, status is on the list. You know, these are the things that make people crazy. And at your second Saturn return, it's not that those things don't matter anymore, but they matter less. And so everything This is something I realized in my Saturn return that I had not seen in advance, and and it came to me in exact words. My my passion for madness was much reduced. Yes. (laughs) Everything that made me crazy had less power over me. And, And it's like crazy doesn't make you happy. It can make you ecstatic for 20 minutes, but you know it, it won't make you happy in the long run. Therefore, with inerring Capricornian logic, we have good reason to believe that the final third of life will be the happiest period of your whole life, simply because you'll be less crazy. And so far, you know, I'm like 15 years past it now, and, uh, and it's working out. It's working out. I think what I've just said is fundamentally true and good news. That's phenomenal. That's an, like, it just, it's beautiful to hear it because I do feel like there's the space of the second Saturn return coming up and it's just met with this fear of I'm dying. And one of the perspectives that I take and I teach Saturn with is from the time that we're born, you enter your first doorway, you have your first Saturn return and you walk through another. And in this idea of doorways, the shutting of the past or putting it in the filing cabinet as a passage to new life, 
And what's available in that life scheme seems to be something, it's a nice way around the you're just going to die concept. But then we talk about the things of death because I can't move from the maiden, the mother, or being in the sage time without shedding and dying off in some way, right? Exactly. Exactly. It's got to be... The chapters have to change. And then you get a whole new cast of characters, which is typically very exciting as well. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. That That's part of it, too. And and every day, the person you were yesterday is dead and buried. You know, it, 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 there's, death is, uh, we create more drama around it than is necessary. I, I think if you discuss the subject with the angels, they'll, they'll point that out. Absolutely. Well, and if you just discuss it with um, a non-American culture, yeah. it is typically much more accepted as well. And I think for in my work where I found myself going more towards the lunar phases and the progressed lunar phases, it was this concept of unwiring the fear of death and instead celebrating the passage of time and season. And what can you do with that besides just go, I'm going to die and have that internal paralyzing fear? Yeah, absolutely. You find that so vividly in the uh, that waning lunar uh, crescent, the balsamic moon, as Roger called it, and and it's uh, it's like uh, death and rebirth, you know, all over again. And it's a nice reminder that we're just part of nature. We too are of nature, but we seem to have multiple lives in one lifetime and i don't know if deer or turtles or and they live forever i don't even know if they do it but we yeah. get more than one life in a lifetime and i think that's geared to saturn yeah i think so it, it's it's what uh keeps us anchored in reality so <laughs> it, I, I as a you know I, I i'm a capricorn with the sun neptune square so i you know i kind of wear a two left shoes some of the time but uh the the tension like like what is the planet of reality you know the standard astrological answer would be saturn you know reality testing but i actually think neptune is a pretty good candidate mm. you know, for the planet of reality when we kind of spell it with a capital r and 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 think about reality in the deepest way that we can possibly embrace it it becomes more neptunian than saturnian Sure. Well, and so having to dance the dance of those two, one who wants to create the structure and the other who wishes to dissolve it, right? Yeah. It's like, no, 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 yeah. you're yeah. spirit in spirit form and you are cased in a human body. Uh-huh. uh-huh. For a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For uh-huh. a while yeah. on a time frame. Wonder, you're wondering about, you know, the animals, turtles and so on. I, I might even think of, uh, of, of flowers, you know, and, yeah. uh, how uh, uh, you know a flower lives and blooms and withers and and dies and and then comes back the next season and mm-hmm. and this gets into deep metaphysical territory. I think we die and then come back. You know, I'm a firm believer in reincarnation, but uh, I the you know a Capricorn with an Aries moon and Saturn and Virgo on the midheaven, I'm not coming back. You know, that's going to be dead and gone. Right. When I come back, the you know, I'll still be a petunia, so to speak. I'll still be a, a human, but I'll be in a new season, in, in a new form, a new body, obviously, but in some ways in a new consciousness. And it's a, it's a profound meditation of Neptune and Saturn interacting, you know, that, that something really does dissolve. And, and it's like... Uh, is every every season's petunia a different petunia, or is there really just kind of one archetypal petunia that keeps coming back? And you know, I I'd love to have a bottle of wine with you in a nice Spanish cafe, and we could talk about that for about six hours. Oh my gosh! And we'd still land at. I think we're gonna die. <laughs> In the uh-huh. end, uh-huh. right? <laughs> yeah, a good bet. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We were born and it, the show will end in this form at some point. Yeah. So let's talk about the forms. I would I would love to explore just the forms a little bit because we ha- we start the Saturn dance. I believe we start the Saturn dance when we get here. That's the portal in. And then we traditionally will hear it. We start to count time when we move to seven and hit the Saturn 
square. Yeah. And I have raised children. I have been a children and I have raised children. Yeah. It is very real. It is a, a breaking away point and the maturity that shows up there. I remember watching my daughter go into first grade and just this sense of her going to the door, like, I don't need you to do that for me. I have legs, but also can you come back very quickly and get me from this place? (laughs) Uh The age of reason, as they say, you know? Yeah. And so it's a really interesting thing to see the timekeeper square the individual's timekeeper and how that process of maturity begins to tip a bit. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. uh, it's a, like any square, it's a, it, it does have its challenges. It has its its difficulties. You know, we start to become aware of the uh, law of consequences uh, and for our actions, uh, uh, limits that we might have. And, and nobody really likes that. It's, of course, absolutely necessary as you know, we become initiated into the human race. But uh, yeah, turning seven, seven or eight years old, the kids need a lot of help, a lot of support. At that time, they also need not to have help and not to have support. And in some ways, that's the more subtle piece of the puzzle, you know, to let them land on their own two feet, give them permission to make mistakes, learn some things the hard way. You know, it's hard for a parent to overcome the the compulsion to constantly protect the child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, I mean, would you agree with me that that is quite cultural as well, depending on where you're at, because I I can tell you just outside of my window, there are many seven-year-olds right now and their parents are somewhere, (laughs) but it's, they're somewhere, you know, whether or not they're looking directly at those children or not, there's a lot of movement and independence happening in this culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worry about that in, uh, in the culture of the United States, where there's uh, there's a lot of fear and anxiety in the air that's led to parents being currently a lot more protective of their children than uh, my parents were with me, maybe yours uh, with you. Mm-hmm. I, in, in the name of helping the children, I, I, I think there's probably some damage being sustained by them. Absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> In general, I'm a Pluto Libra generation. So I'm like, we were the helicopter folks. Yes. <laughs> and then I feel like, you know, we get the Pluto Scorpio gen and they're a little bit more of a protector gen. So somewhere in there is when I really was able to start to see that trend come about. And it is for me too, quite worrisome because it removes the space of consequence and situational awareness. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's progress on because we've got a, we've got a lot of returns to get to or a lot of interactions to get to. But uh-huh. we get to 14 and now we are going to oppose. So mm-hmm. if you're listening and you have a 14 year old or you've ever been a 14 year old, the opposition is on. And that's this test of the authority figures. Yes, right? yes. And, it, and it, I feel like it's just given a little extra spice by the help of a, a Jupiter return so we can kick in puberty and really expand and turn the lights on. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And I see the, uh, it's like we're, we're halfway ar- around the circle, uh, uh, the Saturn circle at that point. And so it makes me think of the uh, ascendant descendant kind of mm-hmm. oppositional relationship and uh, oppositions will often work out in terms of relationship and the possibility of projection onto another person and and so on. And and so that that's all abstract, but what it comes down to is one of the more immutable laws of nature, which is that you will experience uh, serious heartbreak and romantic frustration at the age of 14 or 15. You know, it's it's I'm smiling a little as they say it, it's perhaps not totally universal, but it's it's really very common. And again, this idea of limitation that is is so central to Saturn, but I will experience intimate limitations. I, I will I will uh have to experience some degree of realistic compromise with people whose attitudes, values, and direction are different from my own. And this is so fundamental to maturation, right back to that key Saturn word. 
And it's really, I think the thing that I want to keep reminding us in this podcast is that it's the internal pressures of this dance as well. They're not these simply external things. Yes, the teenager leaves the house, but the breakdown in intimacy, the heartbreak can also be felt on the side of the parent. You know, if you are parenting a 14 year old, you know that please drop me off on the corner. I don't want hugs anymore. or I don't want as many (laughs) hugs. And, and, you know, I say, oh, I found this wonderful outfit. And they're like, I don't like that color. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a parental or adult heartbreak that is also involved in that 14 year old opposition, you know, absolutely. It's uh, no matter how old we get, I think we remember the sheer hell of being 14. You know, it, it's it is it is so difficult. And parents uh, who who were really good with younger kids often get into serious trouble with teenagers. Yeah. And uh, I have a wonderful story here. I worked for a, a, a long time with uh, Jeffrey Wolf Green. You know, he and I did a couple of books together, evolutionary astrologer. I've not seen him for many, many years now. He's sort of dropped out. But uh, he, he, I'll do sort of a Jeff Green impression, you know. He, he's brilliant, but there was a kind of naivete about him as well. And he, he uh, was married like four times or something, but he wound up raising seven children they they were they were not all his biologically but he was a good father really good father but but here's here's the story he 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 said people tell me they have trouble raising teenagers i've never had any trouble with teenagers i tell them they can do anything they want to do but if they do something i don't like they have to look me right in the eye and tell me why they did it Oh, well, okay. We are rising, but it's like, it's funny, but it's also honoring their autonomy. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, you have a right to make mistakes. You know, I may be your dad, I may be your mom, but you know, you, this is your life. And, but uh, Mm -hmm. connect with me, relate to me. You do something I don't like, explain to me what your motivations were what your purpose was. It just calls them to their best truth. And I think that's that's the way to handle kids around that Saturn opposition. Right. And I think the brilliance is, is knowing that life is happening in cycles. So where you've been, you will likely be again in many of the cycles that we experience. So it's like, instead of just thinking, okay, yeah, I had a in Saturn opposition or my child had that. Remember, market what happened what did you do then how did the compromise find itself because you'll be coming back to that again but the the brilliance of getting older is we are potentially able to bring some wisdom (laughs) to the next event yeah absolutely so then we have to square again before Mm -hmm. we return so now we get another square in the mix and we're 21 right where are we we're 21 we're 21 so 20, yeah, 20, yeah. 21 in, in that range. Yeah. Do you remember your 21 Saturn square? Uh, yeah. And, and it's, uh, of course, coincides with uh, the uh, Uranian square, the waxing Uranian square as well, which makes it, it's why, why 21, it's like all, every culture seems to make a big fuss out of turning 21. And when you think about it, it's like, why you know why not 20 you know it's a, a round number but there's so much astrology focused at at 21 humans have even who didn't believe in astrology have always recognized this organic change and 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 so uh ideally uh we are being launched into the world at that point i i i actually i think the the best way for me to enter this is to think of of that waxing uranian square that is inseparable from the waning saturn square and so uranian energy uh you know i am what i am don't tell me what to do and and uh so a kid at 21 a person at 21 faces this very difficult transition it's like up until now in my life I, I've had free rent, free food, somebody to bail me out no matter what happens. Uh, and I'm supposed to leave this. Right. I, I'm supposed to walk away from this sweet deal and 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 go 
be a barista and try to live on minimum wage. <laughs> I mean, there's something in the psyche that doesn't want to leave home, but there's also something in the psyche that knows I've got to, I've mm. got to. And, and I've got to is, is the correct answer. And so there's a struggle. And, and, and so, well, I, again, I turn this into almost a joke, but it's one of those jokes that has some content to it. So somebody 21 years old, you know, uh, well, I love my mother and father. Don't get me wrong. I really love them, but I would never live the kind of life that they lived. You yes, know, the, the judgment. The dismiss of them. And when it gets really bad, it's the slam doors, you know, of, you know, I, I'll never darken my door again. You know, the parents blow it as bad as the kid. And, and then where it becomes sort of funny is five years later, that same person, you know, my mom and dad have grown up a lot in the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. As you're speaking, that's what I was thinking. As I'm like, there's so much judgment there about how they, whoever the authoritative they are, usually the parents, but there's other they's, are doing it all wrong. Yeah, yes. And you exactly. would be doing it much better on a minimum wage. <laughs> we are we are so insecure about our exit yes. that we have to demonize the home in order to psychologically prepare ourselves for the formidable task of leaving it. You know, and and so I I I, I just love astrology because if you talk to an intelligent parent with a 21-year-old kid, you know, going through these kinds of transitions, and there's a lot of Saturn in this to learn and to stand on your own two feet. And and what we create in a receptive parent, so here's my favorite term, informed compassion, you mm -hmm. know, informed compassion for what their child is going through. It helps the parent handle it more gracefully. Absolutely. Well, and that's a beautiful thing. And so if you're listening, you can take this away right away. A part of the cycles is one, knowing they're coming, they are going to happen. No one is exempt for them unless you die. And how to navigate them. What's the emotional, intuitive, and intellectual intelligence that you can bring to it to help another person walk through? They're going to be as challenging as they are, but you don't have to torch the hut, you know? <laughs> Sometimes maybe you do. I mean, I don't know. That might be in your soul story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so then we return, and you're right. We get down to this 28 and a half, 29 right there, entry point, and the judgment falls away. And it's like, oh, well, wait a minute, those adult people weren't that bad, you know, and that's a very easy way to say it. But what I like to celebrate about that, Stephen, is that I teach people, I'm like, it's the first time you're officially in your adult form spiritually mentally, physically. And it's like walking yeah. through a doorway and conceptions and ideas that you had six months ago, you walk through that doorway and it's like, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And it's not something you can force. Right. Right. Exactly. It's uh, you know, a lot of the mythology that we project onto turning 21, that we're an adult now, really applies to the Saturn return a lot more accurately because we've entered, uh, I, okay, I think that the purpose of the first Saturn cycle, like birth to 29 and a half, if I had to reduce it to one word, it's dreaming. You know, it's like you're, you're trying to dream in the sense of searching for a vision of who you are, what you believe in. And so you need openness and possibility. Just We have such good instinct around this, like a 25-year-old person, let's say a 25-year-old woman who's uh, not sure she really wants to marry her boyfriend, even though she loves him, uh, doesn't know yet whether she wants to have children, uh, turns down the Fortune 500 company job to go be a barista in London for a while as she kind of finds herself this is a person you're going to want to have dinner with when she's 45, you know, because she's dreaming. She's still open. And, and her failure to make commitments in this case, I think it's appropriate to view it positively, you know, that mm -hmm. she's still a work in progress. She's still discovering herself and that's what we should do. But then watch this 10 years later, somebody's 35 and they're not sure they want to be committed to this person. Uh, they're thinking of maybe having a kid, but they don't know. And 
and they're still a barista in London and, and you know and and right. it's not what they really want to do with their life. And 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 we have a naturally somewhat more judgmental or worried attitude towards them. And built into this is the idea that that you dream in the first cycle and you have to have the courage to dream. And then at the first Saturn return, make it real, you know, do something about that dream. It's about building on it. It's like when we're younger, we, we say, when I grow up without irony, when we're in our thirties, we still often say it, but with a smile on our face, you know, yes. you know <laughs> if you're not growing up now, you're not going to be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's an interesting dynamic to watch a person do their dance with Saturn to see where they are willing to commit. And I continue to find out that commitment is just commitment. It is what it is. And there's no real wiggling around it. Yes, and it seems to have a couple attitudes that go with the commitment, right? It's either this sucks and it's terrible and oh my God, right? Or this is the best commitment I've ever made. But if it's a long enough commitment, you get the, the span of them. But at every stage, it's just commitment. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And commitment, commitment is a beautiful word. Here's another word that's inseparable from it that doesn't sound so beautiful. Limitations. Yes. And classic Saturn word. And uh, Saturn is the planet of limitations or limits. And of course, that, that makes it sound like the greater malefic. I never use that language. Mm -hmm. Saturn is more respect than that. But I, I, in illustrating this, I, I picture you one day long, long ago in your life. You're just a tiny little kid. You woke up one morning and it's like, uh, I'm a little girl. That means... Yeah. There's not a chance I'm going to be a little boy in the course of, of, of this lifetime, you know, barring surgical interventions, I guess I should say. Right. That. But, but, you know, not a chance I'll be a boy. And so in one fell swoop, half of human experience, you know, off limits for you. You know, you're, you're, you're female. Mm -hmm. a similar parallel but opposite experience, obviously. And, and that, that day when you woke up realizing you're a little girl, it's like, cool, you know, that's something about me. <laughs> I know what I am, and and I'm I'm a little girl from this state, and from this family, and you know I'm a Democrat, or you know I mean each time we define ourselves, we've mm -hmm. also defined what we are not, and and it's like the whole first Saturn cycle, kind of searching for those limits. I think of us like a infinitely expansible balloon, expanding within this irregular crystal that is our true adult identity. And mm -hmm. until the first Saturn return, the balloon is still expanding. But by the Saturn return, it's taken the shape of that crystal. It doesn't mean we stop growing, but our growth begins to go in a different direction. We're using the vehicle we have created for our growth from that point on. And it's there's a fair amount of clarity in the vehicle, even if we get to the other Saturn stops and decide that that's no longer the vehicle we want to travel in, right? That's the part that I think is really interesting is that at some point there just has to be the say yes or say no in order to move forward. And yes. you can change it out later, but there's just no wiggle way around it. Exactly. Exactly. That's Saturn's law right there. And it's a uh... It seems heavy and restrictive until you experience it. And then you begin to realize it, it feels good. It feels good to know who yeah. you are, to have made your stand in the world. And and that's yeah. so much what Saturn is about. Because I feel like if we can, if you get to that point of the commitment of the limitation and you begin to grow in one direction, the discipline brings freedom. It's the waffling in every direction where everything is everything or nothing's nothing. This is not a place for growth. It is a place for chaos. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And in human form, we treat chaos in multiple ways that are not particularly useful. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh -huh. And if we, if we happen to need chaos, that's why God created Pluto and Neptune or Uranus. Because <laughs> right. they will a monkey wrench in our, our Saturn machinery from time to time. <laughs> that's that's but, a lot. 
<laughs> I think the best way the universe made us, it, you know, attracted to other human beings. It's like, there you go. That's all the <laughs> chaos you need. I promise. <laughs> if you want chaos, try love, right? <laughs> 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 absolutely okay so we make it to the first one and there are other stops in the middle but i'd love to take a really big jump and focus in on the second one because yeah. this is the one that i'm finding more and more people are coming into my sphere and are coming to astrology older ready to practice astrology but they're at the second saturn return so there's this kind of question of what do i have to offer and it's the challenge of an entire life of reflection and where i like to lead people here is i'm like oh man you get to walk through the doorway of this next saturn return into your sage time where you've got a full book of boo-boos and successes that you have to offer yes. as well Exactly. That's very much the heart of the matter. Uh, I, I think of a, a prosaic little scene. It's been repeated countless times. Uh, grandma comes for a visit. It's an extended visit. She's going to be with the family for a few weeks, lives in another state, you know, some kind of scenario like that. And a happy, happy, functional family. And there's a nine-year-old girl and grandma is knitting, knitting a scarf. And inevitably, the little girl says to grandma, will you teach me how to knit? And if we think about it objectively, trying to teach a nine-year-old how to knit is very likely to be an absolute catastrophe you know, for <laughs> obvious reasons. But, but of course, grandma, grandma says yes, and grandma is so happy, and the kid is happy. And it's because this archetypal process is happening, so characteristic of life's third Saturn cycle, beginning with the second Saturn return, where, where the joy of the elder derives from passing something on to the younger generations. In, in life's second cycle, the middle cycle of Saturn, much of our joy legitimately comes from personal accomplishment. We dreamed our dream. Now we live the dream. We make our stand. We have a profession, perhaps. We have family or relationships, a role in the community. We And it's there's a lot of me, me, me in it. And that's okay, you know. But then in the third cycle, where the end of life is looming psychologically, there arises in a conscious elder a great generosity of spirit. It's like what I have learned, what I have accumulated, let me pass it on. In, in the sort of most I don't know, grounded, practical, uh, boring uh, expression of all of this, the, the idea of, uh, you know, we're, we enter our second Saturn return and we're maybe writing our will, you know, we're going to give away our material possessions and we think about it, it's like, this is about dying, this is about losing everything you have. But the weird thing is, writing a will is actually kind of happy, you know, we're, we're right. thinking of all the joy we're going to be able to give to our niece or our grandchild or, you know, who, whoever it might be. And so this, this giveaway, and if, if all we have to give is money, well, at least we have that, that's worth something. But what really puts a smile on grandma or grandpa's face is when they're able to pass on knowledge, skills, and and the greatest one of all, wisdom, wisdom yeah. that is received. Can can I take this one one step further? Yes, I, I, please. I'm not afraid of being tedious, but astrology is so rich and complex, and and so the source of in life's middle cycle is accomplishment making our stand and so on, success in our life. The source of joy in the third cycle after the second Saturn return is considerably centered on the sense of giving our gift and having it received. Mm -hmm. and, and so the grandchild is happy to learn how to knit and grandma's at least as happy as the kid. So there's a transaction, a symbiosis between the younger ones and the older ones. And then the next step, it's, it's kind of a heavy one. What if you pass your second Saturn return 
and you haven't learned a damn thing in life, and you have no wisdom at all, you have nothing to give except money, you know, and the kids are circling like vultures waiting for you to die so they can get the money. And right. uh, it, we, if we have nothing to give and no one wants to receive it, there's a big one. No one wants to receive it because we all are magnetically attracted to elders, you know, true elders who glow in the dark, you know, we love their presence, but old farts. No, it's like, it will do <laughs> anything to stay away from an old fart. And, and, and so that old fart who's earned that designation through spiritual laziness in life, mm -hmm. it's not in a position to give something that will in turn feedback as joy for right. that person. And that leads me to my point, which is if what I'm saying is true, I have every reason to think it is, but if it is true, we could test it. If it's true, there would be an epidemic of geriatric depression. And I, I'd say QED, you know, there it is, that this is the source of it, that if we have nothing to give, there's no more meaning in our life. And so this is the symbiosis. The old need the young, just as the young need the old. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful relationship when it it's works. It's a really, really interesting concept because I think that I see that true and has been shown true all over the world where you see the cultures and the different ages living and working together. And it's, you know, and I had a conversation when I started learning Korean um, with a woman who owned a business and our kids went to the same school as well. And her mother did a lot of the parenting. She ran the business. She would run the kids where they needed to go. But the real life parenting was being done by grandma. And I was talking to her about it. And she said, really, in our culture, a lot of times is what's happening is that the parenting is being done by the grandparents. And the movement, exactly what I was seeing, is being done by the parents because they have the energy for the movement, but they don't have the wisdom of having survived the seasons or the patience that the grandparent. And so this idea that realistically, we're being parented one generation away every time and how that works and how we see culturally around the globe, that is a benefit. Yes, absolutely. It is a natural form of the human family. Yes. So it, you know, these, uh, blue zones, you know, they, they call them now the uh, places on the earth where a lot of people live to be 100 years old. Yeah, and yeah. They, they, uh, they eat their vegetables, you know, it has something to do with diet. But uh, that's, uh, that result is not that dramatic. The, the dramatic thing is the, these cultures have a sense of, of community where yes. everybody belongs. And, and that's kind of a broad idea. But then a subset of it is, is that old people and young people can have friendships. You know, they'll interact with each other, call each other by their first names and, and, and learn from each other. And in a, a culture where that's, where that's natural, uh, it, it works well. I I went to I went to Australia to teach, and and you know I have to have to be a good guest, of course. And and so I, I arrive in Australia, and it's like, oh, we're going to go to the club and do karaoke tonight. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> I didn't have a good attitude for it. But I, I get to this private club in Australia. It's very working class, and there's probably hundred people there, and uh, karaoke, you know, getting up on the stage, and and there's there's kids doing rap and there's 80 year old guys doing Elvis Presley impressions and, and, and everybody's clapping for everybody. And it, it was just eye popping. It was, uh, dare I say it on American, you know, as, as a yeah. U.S. citizen, we were very stratified by, by yeah. age and, you know, the 55 and older communities and such, you know, that have a gate and no kids voices ever. And, it's not healthy. It's not good for anybody. It's not conducive to happiness. Yeah. And I think that that is personally and professionally where I find myself is in the space of where the astrology, where I see it playing out, especially in places like the United States. And it's like, this is not healthy or this is harmful 
And what is to be done about it? Because that's really, I'm a Taurus. I'm like, well, what's the solution, right? <laughs> so I'm like, what's the practical solution to things like that? And and looking at it from a global perspective of how do we reintroduce that into places in the United States? Because people are lonely. Children are lonely. Elderly people are lonely. And the people in the middle are running themselves psychotic, trying to be all of the positions. So yes. what, how do we fix that? And I think astrology is a, is a midway point to begin to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. Yes. With, yeah. with it, statements of I'm, that's not the cycle I'm in. I think that's a very powerful statement. Exactly. It's a, a, astrology. Is a, obviously I love it and it can be pro- profoundly helpful in all of this. But I, I would also quickly say it, it, nobody has to know astrology to, to understand right. these concepts. And, you know, if, if astrology is a red flag for somebody, let's just keep keep our mouth shut about it and talk about how much fun it is, you know, for younger people and older people to, to get together and laugh and play and be relaxed and not formal around each other. And, you know, people, I, I think they everybody nods their head but then we're up against embedded structures in society. Mm-hmm. You know, so how do we change those structures? And I, I don't know, you're a Taurus, I'm a Capricorn. Give us an hour, we probably solve the problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, and it's good because you've got that Aries moon and I'm a Virgo rising. So we'll be out of here shortly. We'll get it sorted out. <laughs> Virgo midheaven with Saturn on it. So what, what is it? <laughs> so because you have been there, you've you've done this a couple times. I would love to hear your experience with your your first Saturn return and the second. Who who did you become? Who what happened? It's a, it, yeah, I chance to talk about myself. You know, <laughs> um, you know, I, it's a, I want to. I, I, I will talk about myself. Well, let me start off by saying uh, Saturn is very powerful in my chart. I'm a Capricorn, so I'm sensitive to it. Saturn is like right smack on my midheaven in you know five or six degrees of Virgo. So it's a very, very strongly placed Saturn. And I want to talk about that personally, but there's a drum I'd like to beat once. And, and that's that uh, an error astrologers often make, I think is to look at Saturn and think of accomplishment and then immediately turn that into a professional kind of framework. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, that's the Saturn rules Capricorn. Capricorn is the 10th sign. The 10th house is the house of career and the conflation of signs, planets, and houses, which creates a lot of mess, even though they're related, they're not the same. That That's led this uh, to this idea that all the Capricorns are ambitious and anybody with a strong Saturn is going to be very professional. Uh, it, it's really not true. Uh, Saturn is about great works and raising a family is a great work. Meditation can be a great work. What, what house is your Saturn in? What sign is it in? You know, we're going to get a very specific sense of focus. The reason I feel the need to say this, I'm not dodging your question about myself, but my my Saturn is on the midheaven. So the great works of my life have tended to be public and professional, even though that's not true of everybody. Right. And okay, so it, it's like clockwork. Uh, uh, <laughs> Saturn, uh, my, my first Saturn return happened in uh, 1978. In uh, November of 1976, I bought a sailboat. I had a terrible job, clerical job with the university, but I bought a sailboat, 22-foot sailboat. And my girlfriend and I set out sailing, summer of 77, sailed basically halfway down the east coast of the U.S., Chesapeake Bay and New York Harbor and all that. And... uh, when I came back, end of 77, I realized I wasn't going to get a job. I was going to see if I could make it as an astrologer. I, I had a bit of a practice built up. I went back to the town, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I'd I'd been and uh, uh, established my practice. And and it took off. So my, my first Saturn return was, you know, me hanging up my shingle as a professional astrologer. 
It just worked like clockwork. Very soon I'd written my first book and, and so on. And then, you know, 30 years later, more or less, 29 and a half years later, um, I come to my second Saturn return. Now, in my years in North Carolina, years practicing astrology full time in North Carolina, actually about a third of my work was uh, counseling, just straight counseling with people you know, who would come every week or every two. I was like a psychotherapist without a license, uh, essentially. I do a reading for somebody. They say, I need to talk about it. You shook me up. And I say, of course, you know, I'm pretty soon I'm doing psychotherapy yeah. without a license. And and that was a huge part of my practice. And I, I loved it very much. And I was also very active in bands and I was no money in that, but playing in, in, in rock bands and having a lot of fun with that too. So my astrology was important to me but it wasn't really my full-time occupation. And then my second Saturn return, October of 2007, February of 2008, and then finally July 14th of 2008, was snicker snack back and forth. July 30th of 2008, I moved to the West. All, all through that Saturn time, my ex-wife and I were building a house out here with all the Saturn complications of that. But I moved to the, the middle of uh, the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. It's the size of Rhode Island, a little town grandfathered into the middle, uh, 3,000 people in it, total isolation. There was no way I was going to have uh, counseling practice. There was no way I was going, to, I, I didn't think there was any way I would continue to be able to see clients face to face because I was so isolated. And so I just went full time astrology, um, mostly recorded readings and, you know, and, and then traveling to teach. And, and so it was, uh, the effect was that I became 100% focused on astrology. Whereas you know previously I was doing it, but I had other other I had some balance in my life. <laughs> well, <I guess> right. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> and, and so you know I, I just became Mister Astrology Machine, and my my apprenticeship groups really they were already in practice, but they took off and I began to travel around the world a lot. Began going to Australia regularly, China, Italy, and uh, mm -hmm. so. It was essentially just that classic Saturn word of of focus, you know. So, but again, both my Saturn returns worked out very much in a in a professional kind of framework. And for you, as a as a as a man developing through that, what was that like for you? Because you know, I work a lot with the Venus energy, and one of the concepts that I work with is that in the femininity. There's an innate value to it. And so women come and there's just, that's it. You're preloaded with all the goods, yeah, right? Whether yeah. or not we know it. But typically when people are coming in a male experience, they have to earn their value out in the world. And so I wonder, what was that like for you to, you're going, you're doing these things, you're living your life, but developing as a male person as well. Was that, how did that, how was that? <laughs> you know, I, I had, uh, Great advantage as far as that went in in that uh, I, I I kind of came of age late sixties seventies you know uh, when hippies roamed the earth you know it was uh, it was you know a, a wild time uh, you young folks missed a hell of a party I, I, <laughs> for all the complexities and craziness and and wonder of that time. Uh, the reason I say this is that uh, even though I grew up in a culture that that had this uh, very kind of macho cowboy view of male success, you know, authority and never crying and, you know, all of this, the, 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 the culture in which I came of age was one in rebellion against that. You know, we men were growing our hair like women, you know, and they would make fun of us. Are, are you a boy or a girl? You know, this this is like 60-year-old garbage, but, you know, it, it was like we were, 
weren't articulate about it, but but we were claiming what we might call our feminine side. And, mm-hmm. and men who were successful at that uh, achieved a certain status. And so the old way of achieving status and dignity was breaking down. So I got lucky being an astrologer, being good at it, being successful with it, just played right into it, into the bullseye of of that logic. It's like uh, I, I I had uh, successfully uh, defied what we used to call the man, but in right. this case maybe, maybe you know the, I successfully defied that whole traditional male archetype. And as a result, uh, I got the girls, you know, which is the status. You know, so the, how, how it you know, I became interesting. I became sexy. I became successful. I, if I'd been born 10 years earlier, it would have been a lot more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so from your first Saturn return to your second return to current, where you are in life, yeah. how do you feel about yourself as a as a person in the story you've lived? I, I feel incredibly lucky. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I could retire if I wanted to. I probably have to scale back my life a little bit, but uh, I, I'm in a position where I could retire, but I don't want to. You know, I'm 74 years old, and and I I still you know wake up at 6:30 or 7 every morning and get to work. I, I it's uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy astrology, and and that's a simple statement. It's also I, I feel so blessed to have a meaningful life, you know, because I I help people, and and they tell me that you know, and so I, I get testimonials you know several times a week and 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 that it just feels really good to to not have any reason to question the purposefulness of my life i i i you know more aware of my age of course the the uh needle is beginning to approach e you know as far as uh, life force goes but i'm still healthy and strong and zero thought of retiring you know it's just it's like uh, i i used to say would the pope retire it's like, <laughs> just, but then of course a pope did <laughs> just to yeah. put you on your head right yeah exactly if i find myself losing my my mental competence you know i, I would feel a moral obligation to to stop doing yeah. astrology to stop teaching but uh hopefully uh i would be aware of that if if it did happen. So I I would have sense enough to stop. Okay. Well, here's my last question for you. And I think it's very much so along the Saturnian lines. It's about the maturity piece. And what do you know today? And you can share with people about relationships that you had no idea about 30 years ago. Wow. Wow. You know, it's, uh, I'll sound pretty old, I think, as I say this, but I I, I come by that honestly, that uh, sexual attraction and satisfaction are enormously important, and they relate to some kind of basic connection or stimulation between souls. So I, I would never encourage anyone to ignore uh their feelings in that regard my 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 takeaway line there is trust your lust which uh you know might be the most dangerous three words ever said know, the right. human race, but, but are, are kind of worth putting on the table but with that said uh i i've come to recognize that what makes love really last is something closer to friendship respect for the other person's values, uh, shared interests. These these are things that if, if I'd heard them when I was 25, I'd be piously nodding my head in agreement, but then, you know, checking out the woman's body, basically. Right. right. And, and, and that's being young. I don't want to beat anybody up for being young. But as we we become less defined by our hormones, 
and more defined by our our soul, essentially. I think we get a whole lot better at recognizing the people whom we can genuinely love. And, and so lust and passion are important, and friendship is really important, kind of eighth house and seventh house stuff, I, I would say. And as I've matured, the seventh house has loomed larger. Now, I'm not sure if it's larger than the eighth house, but it used to be dwarfed by it, and sure. and and that's changed. Wow, you've seen some things. That's really an incredible feat, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think you're precious, and I appreciate you coming to talk with me. Well, thank you so much. I think you're precious too, Stormy. Sincerely, what a gift you are to our community. So somewhere along the way. I'll be selling all of your books, I'm sure. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Which will be just a real, real treat to be able to do that. So that's it.